welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives, and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. Today's program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners. You can support the show on a one-time basis by mailing a donation to Adam Graham, P.O. Box 15913, Boise, Idaho, 83715. And I want to thank Carolyn. And I also want to thank a listener who went ahead and sent me a check from the business. And I think, looking at the signature and searching online, that the gentleman's name or is Eric, if I'm wrong, I apologize, but that's my best guess. So thank you so much, though. I do appreciate the donation. And uh, you can also become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters for as little as $2 per month at patreon.greatdetectives.net. Judge Baylor coming on at the detective sergeant level of $7.14 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support. Well, now it is time to get into this week's episode of Dangerous Assignment, and I should note that we did have a couple of lost episodes between last week's and this week's, so that ends the sort of streak of the episodes being kind of in line with the actual date uh, we're listening to them. This one comes from June 24th, 1953, and the title is Capture James C. Stoller. Dangerous Assignment. Transcribed starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Yeah, danger is my assignment. I get sent to a lot of places I can't even pronounce. They all spell the same thing, though, trouble. But when I walk into the commissioner's office, I don't realize that this assignment's going to wind up with me doing my best to pull a building down on my head. Morning, Commissioner. You sent for me? Steve, there's to be a meeting tomorrow night somewhere in the city of Damascus between representatives of a country behind the Iron Curtain and members of a desert tribe from the Near East. The object of that meeting is to exchange prisoners. Exchange prisoners? Go on, Commissioner. Two weeks ago, the tribe captured a foreign agent who'd been giving them no end of trouble. In retaliation... Let me guess. The Iron Curtain boys grabbed off someone from the desert tribe. Right. One of their chiefs. So the deal's been made, huh? This agent for the chief even swapped. How do we figure in this, Commissioner? We want to get our hands on that foreign agent, Steve. He's an American traitor named Stoller. Stoller? Well, well, our old friend James C. Stoller? One of their top propagandists. A vicious, clever writer and a killer. We specifically want him for the murder of an American army officer during the war. Have we contacted the tribe about it? No, I'm certain they'd turn him over to us if we asked him, but they've already made the deal, and if they backed out now, it'd place the life of their chief in jeopardy. We can't ask them to do that. Our best bet, then, is to wait until the exchange of prisoners has been effected, and then move in and grab Stoller. Right. Get over to Damascus, Steve, and check with our contact there, a man named Barid. He's the man who tipped us off about the meeting. Find out exactly where that meeting is to take place and grab Stoller. Well, that's it. You've got your assignment. Good luck. National Broadcasting Company is presenting Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy in the role of Steve Mitchell, colorful two-fisted government agent. At all those places of the world where danger and intrigue walk hand in hand, there you will find Steve Mitchell on another Dangerous Assignment. Here's a reminder to all of you mystery and adventure fans, if you enjoy Dangerous Assignment, you're sure to be entertained by Dragnet, another of the great programs on NBC Radio. Yes, each week, Dragnet takes you step-by-step on the side of the law 
in the solution of an actual case from the official records of the Los Angeles Police Department. From Crime to Punishment, Dragnet is true. Listen each week over most NBC radio stations for Dragnet, starring Jack Webb as Sergeant Joe Friday with Ben Alexander as his partner, Frank Smith. And remember, for the reenactment of an actual police case, listen each week for Dragnet, the true stories of your police force in action. Sure, I've got my assignment. Get over to Damascus in Syria and find out where a prisoner exchange meeting is to take place. My job is to grab off one of the prisoners, an American trader named James Stoller. We want him for murder. It's late Thursday afternoon when my plane lands in Damascus. I hurry into the old walled city to bar its small shop. He takes me into his living quarters in the back. There has been a change in plans, Mr. Mitchell. The meeting hasn't been called off, has it? No, but instead of everyone meeting here in Damascus, the exchange will take place at two separate points. The tribal chief will be delivered to his friends at a place near the Turkish border. And what about Stoller? He will be turned over to his associates at El Musabi. It is a deserted village to the east of here. When? Sometime after midnight tonight. Once the tribal leader has been safely delivered in the north, a signal will be flashed, a fire lighted on Mount Kadir. The signal for the tribe to turn Stoller over to his buddies, huh? Yes. Okay. How far is this village from here? Many hours' ride into the desert. I have made all the arrangements for us to travel there in a manner that will not cause suspicion. Yeah, it wouldn't do for Stoller's friends to know I'm on my way. There is a caravan leaving Damascus at sundown. It will pass through the village later this evening. Uh, will we get there in plenty of time? Yes. We should arrive at El Musabi well before midnight. Good. Well, I guess the change of clothes is next in order, huh? I have several robes here. You can select the one you wish. The one on the end, the tattletale gray job. That'll do. Here you are, Mitchell. Now, if you will sit down here, please. Hmm? Your face and hands will have to be stained. Oh, sure. You know, last time I got a facial like this, I came out of it smelling like the inside of an old tobacco pouch. <laughs> Berry juice will do as well. Okay, Barred. My face is in your hands. An hour later, Barid and I ease out of the shop. I'm dressed in a snappy desert outfit, a creation of Hart Schaffner and Hassan Bay with a wraparound beanie to match. We hop aboard a couple of Arabian nags and trot on over to the marketplace where the caravan is forming. We finally get underway and start out across the desert. There's a hot wind blowing in from the east and it's whipping the sand around us, but it serves as an excuse to keep my head down and my face covered up. It's a long haul and the scenery is pretty much the same until we reach the mountains. We find our way through a narrow pass and drop down into the desert again, into a small village. Hey, Barid, are we pulling in here? Yes, only for a short time, however. It is a regular stop along the caravan route. Well, well, get down, stretch our legs. I'd sure like to wash this sand out of my teeth with a tall schooner of beer. Down the street, there's a coffee house. Good, let's go. This way... I follow Barrett as we make our way through the caravan and the crowd of villagers who have come to bargain with the drivers. Then, as we reach the door of the coffee house... Look out! I duck down as the knife whoops past and buries itself into the door over my head. Across the way, Mr. Mitchell. There is the man. Come on! It is no use. He has disappeared into the crowd. Did you get a good look at him? No, only a glimpse. His face was covered. I saw his hand raise the knife. That is when I cried out. Good thing you did. Otherwise, that knife had been planted right between my shoulder blades right now. Look, Barid, who did you make arrangements with for our trip? The caravan chief himself, a cousin. I simply told him we wished to travel east with a caravan. That is all. You didn't by any chance happen to mention that I'm an American agent. But of course not. I told him you were a distant relative. He's your cousin, and you ring me in as a distant relative? Uh, we have a large family. He would not know. Well, he might be interested. He hates our family. I am the only one he will speak to. Oh, great. Mitchell, I have been thinking. This man who threw the knife might possibly have mistaken you for someone else. The robes you wear identify you as a member of a tribe from a nearby country. And as you know, there are many feuds. Yeah, in... so it could have been a mistake, but I think the gent who tossed that knife spotted this disguise, and he doesn't want me to take this trip to El Musabi. Come on, let's keep looking around. <laughs> We 
We mingle with the crowd, but there's no sign of the man we're looking for. Finally, the caravan is ready to roll on. Barrett and I keep to the rear of the column as it moves out into the desert, and we keep our eyes open. It's shortly before midnight when we sight the deserted village of El Mosabi, a low, sprawling pile of mud huts sitting quietly in the moonlight. As the caravan files through the main drag, Barrett and I slip back, then ease off into the shadows. The caravan rolls on, disappears. We tie up the horses and spend the next few minutes cautiously exploring the village, then... As we emerge on a small back street. Look, Mr. Mitchell. Parked behind that mud hut. A desert car. Yeah. One of those half-track jobs. Seems like we have company. Inside the house. Is that a light? It is. Come on, let's have a look. You see anyone? Yeah. A man stretched out on a cot. Looks like he's taking a nap. You there. What do you want? Oh, oh, more company. A woman coming down the street, British by the sound of her voice. You better do the talking, Barry. We're just passing through. You get it? Do you wish something? Good evening. We are travelers. My cousin and I, we journey to Zakare. Zakare? You're a long way from there. Yes, we thought we might spend the night here. You came with a caravan? Caravan? One came through a few moments ago. Aye, but we thought it was not due until morning. We had planned to meet it here, continue our journey. You hear that, my cousin? The caravan has already passed. What is it, Myra? Who are you... Oh, we have visitors, sir. Good evening. Good evening, Effendi. Please excuse this intrusion, but my cousin and I saw your auto, the light, and believing the village to be deserted, well, we were curious. Yes, I understand. We've made El Musabi our temporary headquarters. I'm Professor Varel, an archaeologist, and this is my daughter. You're travelers? Yes, we left Aleppo this morning. Aleppo? You had quite a journey. Uh, Myra, my dear. Yes, Father? Uh, our visitors have had a long, tiring trip. Some refreshments, perhaps. Mm, something to eat? Of course. Oh, you are most generous, Effendi, but the hour is late and we have disturbed not you. Not at uh, all, not at all, my friend. And there is the caravan to be overtaken. We must hasten after it. it... Oh, I see. Well, then, a happy journey. Uh, thank you, Effendi. Come, my cousin, we must hurry. <laughs> Minutes later, Barrett and I ride out of the village, and when we're certain we're out of sight, we circle around. Back in the village, we tie up our horses and slip into a hut across the street from the building where the professor and his daughter are staying. Mr. Mitchell. Maybe he is an archaeologist. Maybe he isn't. Perhaps they are really here in El Musabi to meet Stoller. Huh? Yeah. He seemed to be most hospitable. Sure, maybe he just wanted a better look at us. Mr. Mitchell, the signal. Huh? Over that way toward the hills, the fire. Yeah, it's the signal, all right. The tribe ought to be bringing Stoller along pretty soon. We'll just keep an eye on the... What is it, Mr. Mitchell? Listen. A plane. Yeah. If that's a commercial airliner, it's a little off the beaten path, isn't it? There are no established air routes over this area. Let's get out back and have a look. There it is, Mitchell. Look. Yeah, circling. Hey, he's coming around again. Gonna land. Who do you think it is? Not the tribe with Stoller. They couldn't have gotten here this soon. I doubt if they have any planes anyway. Only one answer. Stoller's buddies have come to pick him up in that plane. Then the professor, his daughter... I guess I was wrong. He really must be an archaeologist. Look, the plane's going to land at the other end of the village. I'm going over there. You stick around. But why? Keep your eye on the professor and his daughter. They've certainly heard the plane, and they'll come out to investigate. They could get hurt. Very well. <laughs> I sprint down the back street on the double, reach the edge of the village, and start crawling on my hands and knees through a mass of boulders. Finally, the plane sets down, pulls up less than 30 yards away. There are two men inside. They sit back, light up cigarettes, and wait. Five minutes, ten minutes go by. Then I spot Barry's yellow robe moving through the boulders toward me. I motion him to crouch down low. He does, keeps coming. I look back at the plane. They haven't spotted him. Then I turn around as Barred comes up. Yeah, he comes up fast with the butt of his rifle, and I catch it full on the jaw. Steve Mitchell will continue his dangerous assignment in just a moment. Everyone dreams of a rosy future when they'll finally be able to retire and really enjoy life. Vacationing in different lands, enjoying the beautiful scenery of our own country on a trailways bus, or just basking in the sunshine of their own backyard. Well, that dream can become a reality through United States savings bonds. 
And you don't have to be a rich man to afford United States savings bonds. You can buy a savings bond with a modest $18.75, or you can buy a savings bond for $7,500. But no matter what savings bond you buy, you'll get back $4 for every $3 you put in. And it's easy to buy United States savings bonds. Look into the payroll savings plan where you work. That's the automatic plan for buying savings bonds. Or if you're self-employed, ask about the bond-a-month plan where you bank. And believe me, you'll feel more secure tomorrow if you'll buy United States savings bonds today. Now back to Dangerous Assignment and Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Get up, Mitchell. Oh, well, on your feet, Mitchell, get up. Yeah. Okay. Hey, brother, getting tagged with a rifle butt on the chin is... Hey, wait a minute. You're not Barid. Of course not. I am Hasha. But you've got Barid's robes on. That's what fooled me when I saw you crawl up. Let us say that Barid was kind enough to lend me his robes. What'd you do, kill him? No, he is safely tied up. It occurred to me that for the present, he would be more valuable to us alive. Us? Yes, us, Mr. Mitchell. What? Oh, I didn't see you, Buster. Please, it is Gregor. Flight closed? Yes, I am the pilot of the plane. You came to pick up your old buddy Stoller, huh? Quite right. He served our cause well. That is, until he was stupid enough to get captured. According to your credentials, Mr. Mitchell, you are a United States agent. Stolar is a fellow countryman of yours. Is that by any chance why you are here? You guess, Gregor. In any case, it does not matter. The point is, you are our guest. Oh? Gregor, see the tribesmen approach. Right, right, Asher. And our friend Stolar is with them. They are delivering him right on time. Bully for you. Ah, these superstitious fools. They pull their horses to a stop at a safe distance. Still afraid of airplanes. <laughs> ah, friend Stoller dismounts. Gregor! Welcome, Stoller! Who's that with you? Well, 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 if it isn't my old friend Steve Mitchell. You remember me, Steve? Sure. James C. Stoller. Rat, first class. Say, I like that first class part. Of course <laughs> he remembers you, Stoller. That's why he's here. Now, Steve, you don't mean to say you came all the way over here to get me to go back to the dear old States with you? That was the general idea, Stoller. We like you so well, we'd like to keep you there safe for about 20 years to life. Well, I'm sorry, but I've got no desire to see the Statue of Liberty again. That doesn't surprise me. Stoller, I've invited Mitchell to be our guest. You're going to take him with us? Why not? It occurs to me he undoubtedly has much information of value. Information he might be... uh, Persuaded to reveal to our superiors. Good idea. And you'll love the trip, Mitchell. So much that you may never come back. So I've got a one-way trip staring me in the face. They start hurting me toward the plane. Then I spot Stoller giving a quick look around out of the corner of his eye. And he hangs back behind Gregor a little. Suddenly, I figure something doesn't quite add up. I get the feeling that something's going to happen. Two seconds later, it does. Hey, machine gun! Over the ridge roars the professor's half-track. The girl Myra is driving, and the professor's blazing away with a Tommy gun. Quick, into the plane! Gregor tries for it and doesn't make it, because just then some of the professor's slugs rip into the plane's gas tank. The plane goes up in smoke. Gregor and the co-pilot with it. The concussion knocks me flat. Then I spot Stola running toward the half-track. He jumps in, and they roar away. I get to my feet and run to Hasher, who's blinking his eyes groggily. I'll take the gun, Hasher. Thanks. Uh, the explosion, it knocked me down. The plane... The plane just took off the hard way. I don't understand. Stoller said... Stoller's a lot smarter than I gave him credit for and a little too smart for Gregor and company. What, what do you mean? Stoller knows what happens to guys who goof up in his racket. He knew he wasn't getting rescued just because he was such a nice guy. They were probably going to deal out a little punishment when they got him back, so... He got his friends, the professor and Myra, to rescue him from the rescue party. Oh, dog! Yeah, looks like case of an old dog teaching a few new tricks. At least you will not get him either. Maybe not, but I'm still going to give it the old school try, which means the first thing is for you to show me where you've got Barry tied up. Now, come on, move. I 
Natasha leads me back to the deserted village in one of the mud huts. Barred's inside, none the worse for wear. I release him. Then we tie up Hasha and leave him there. Barred and I grab our horses. We still have a chance to catch them. I don't know, Barred. Chasing a half track on horseback, that's pretty long odds. If they get to the main road ahead of us, we are lost. But the travel will be rough and slow for them before that. And we can cut over the ridge. Okay, let's go. Yeah, cut it. Hey, brother, you weren't kidding when you said this country was rough going, Barid. It is our only chance, Steve. You see, even in the half-track, they must circle around this ridge, but we are going over it. What are those ruins down there on the flat? That is the ancient city of Abad. Not much left. No, a ruined temple. A few piles of stone here and there, that is all. Wait a minute. What is it? Come on, we're going down there. But why? Surely they would not stop there. No, take a look behind one of those piles of stone. A glint of metal? Yeah. Could be part of that half track sticking out. But why were they? Yes, it is the half track. Oh, oh, oh there! Oh. Come on, we we'll leave our horses here and work our way in on foot. All right. Keep your eyes open and your gun ready. I still do not understand why they stopped here. There's your answer. See the half track? Bullet holes in the gas tank. They ran out of gas. In that case, they are somewhere here in the ruins. That's uh, they sure are. Those shots came from the ruined temple. Okay, we're going in. We hug the ground and ease our way into the ruined temple. It goes back a long way. We can't see very far in the gloom. Most of the columns are still standing, but they don't look very steady. Uh, watch out! Oh, brother. That column missed us by six inches. I barely brushed against it, and it started to topple. They're shooting blind. I... Hey, wait a minute. That falling column gave me an idea. Stoller, get smart. Come on out. Come and get me. I don't have to. We'll just bury you and leave you here. Just again. Okay, Barred. Let's both take a few shots at that column over there. See how easy it is? You'll never get me that way. How about you, Professor? You want to get in the way of one of those fallen columns? He's the guy I'm after. Why? He's got the Tommy gun. After we get that out of the way, we can go in after Stoller. How about it, Professor? Want another demonstration? Must be working on him. He's not saying anything, but probably doing a lot of thinking. Professor Barrow, stop you, fool! Steve, it worked. I'm coming out! I'm coming out! He's still got the Tommy gun. <laughs> Stoller got him. There's his Tommy gun lying out there. Yeah, but we stick our neck out after it and we get shot real quick. It is a deadlock. Maybe not. If the next move is what I think it'll be. Here, you take my gun. But why? Fire both of them like I'm still here with you. What are you going to do? Meet them in the parking lot. I inch back out of the temple. Barry keeps firing both guns to make it sound like we're together. If my hunch is right, Stoller and Myra will slip out the back and try for our horses. But if they get there before I do, I'll be staring down a gun barrel and nothing to shoot back with. As it turns out, it's a dead heat. Just as I get to the horses, Myra comes around the rocks. Mitchell! Hi, Myra. Stoller, watch out! Mitchell! Yeah, Mitchell. Uh, let go! Do it. Thanks for the gun. Sorry, Myra, you're not leaving. Let go! I'm... Just take it easy, both of you. Oh, you're tricked, Steve. You're tricked. It worked. Yeah, sure did, Barid. Well, Stoller, looks like you're going to see the Statue of Liberty again after all, but don't be surprised when you sail by if she turns thumbs down on you. Our star, Brian Donlevy, will return in just a moment. Wherever you go, there's radio. And now is the time of the year to have your portable radios checked over so that you'll know that they work when you set off on your vacation, on a weekend trip into the country, or an afternoon at the beach. You'll want to join the millions of your fellow Americans who each summer take their radio entertainment with them wherever they go. And you'll find that wherever you go in this vast country of ours, you'll find a friendly station nearby where you can tune to the familiar NBC chimes, your invitation to the finest in radio listening. This summer, you'll discover that many of your favorite radio programs are continuing through the warmer months. And you'll also learn to know and enjoy a variety of new performers 
who are certain to please with their brand of radio entertainment. So accept our invitation to grand summertime radio enjoyment. Check your portable to make sure it works, and you'll know that you're all set for a happy listening wherever you go this summer when you tune the dial of your nearest station to the National Broadcasting Company Radio Network. Next week, Canada, and a killer who wouldn't stay dead. And that will be Steve Mitchell's dangerous assignment next week. Featured in tonight's cast were Jan Arvan, Vivi Janis, Ben Wright, Paul Fries, and Paul Duboff. This is John Storm speaking. Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell, with Herb Butterfield as the commissioner, is written by Bob Reif and Adrian John Doe, and is directed by Bill Carn. Be with us again next week at the same time when Brian Donlevy, starring in the role of Steve Mitchell, will embark on another transcribed Dangerous Assignment. <laughs> This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. Welcome back. A great action-packed story with Mr. Stoller proving himself a quite capable double-crosser. I also love the way the music was used during the climactic scene to ratchet up the excitement. So again, a really fun episode. Now a bit of housekeeping. Uh, we have a show voicemail. I set this up, and we've had it pretty much cl uh, since close to the start of the series. The reason I set it up is so that you can call in and share your voice and provide your thoughts on uh, the podcast as a whole or on individual episodes. I love it when I get these sort of messages and I can play them on here and we get to hear another voice other than my own. And if you do want to share one of those sort of messages, please call me at 208-991-4783. That's 208-991-4783. Great D with uh, an 8, G-R-8-D. You get to hear me read the opening uh, to Philip Marlowe, you know, get this and get it straight, crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the prison, the gutter, or the grave. There's no other way, but they never learn. I, I've got some really confused voicemails from people who dialed the wrong number. However, I don't frequently share the number vocally, though it's in the show notes, because I've gotten some other messages that kind of frustrate me. So I just want to explain what the voicemail is for and not for. Now, as I said, I really love to get your show feedback that I can share and play on the podcast. But let me just say this frankly and clearly, I won't call you back. Uh, as an example, I just got a voicemail on Memorial Day where a listener who I've never spoken to before or heard from gave his name, gave his phone number, and told me to call him without even telling me what he was wanting called about. I'm sorry, but I won't do that. And I don't say that in a way to just say, it's just this one person and I'm going to go on about it, because this isn't the first time I've gotten that sort of message. And I don't say that in a way to be mean or stuck up, but it's just a matter of a practicality and a boundary so that I can actually do this business. I record nearly 400 new podcast episodes per year when you add up you know, Great Detective, Snack Wagon, Amazing World of Radio, and uh, Public Domain Video Theater, and doing research, recording, and all the support work that needs to be done on the podcast and YouTube channel in order to serve all our listeners and viewers and deliver all of these podcasts as well as taking care of my family and my health, I can't offer one-off phone calls. I have in the past responded to calls because of feeling guilty or thinking, eh, I'll just be nice. It shouldn't be a big deal. Uh, what's happened nearly every time I've done so is that it's taken far longer than I really could afford. It's 
being an unprofitable time, draining and then throws off my work. So they end up having to work extra late or extra long uh, in order to get what I actually need done completed. So I'm not going to do that anymore, even as a one-off. It's not stupid to make mistakes. It's stupid to keep making the same one. Now, if you're a person who'd rather not type everything out you have to say, feel free to leave a voicemail uh, with details and clearly state your email address, and I'll review it and email you a response. But no, so that I can keep doing what I love and make sure we're you know, providing what most folks want to listen to, I'm not calling people back or providing phone tech support on your device as has been requested in the past. And I'll probably also try to share the phone number more. And if I get messages that ignore those sort of boundaries, just know that I will be deleting them without a response. And really welcoming those that are kind of what I set up the voicemail for. All right, well, uh, listener comments and feedback, and we have a new review on the Apple Podcast Store. Uh, this one comes from Abbey Road 28. I've been a huge fan of old time radio since I was in elementary school and would check out LPs of old Sherlock Holmes and the Shadow radio shows. I've been listening to old time radio collections since they first started popping up on the internet and tried every old radio show podcast there is. This is the best of them all. Host Adam not only presents the most popular shows, but manages to find whole series of programs I never knew about. Adam is a great host, and the contextual information he presents is always super interesting. My favorite shows are Richard Diamond, Sherlock Holmes, and The Saint with Vincent Price. Keep up the great work, Adam. I've enjoyed your recent episodes where you have other uh, relevant podcast uh, co-hosts crossovers as well. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate your uh, comments, and I've enjoyed those and the opportunity to make them. I, I don't think I could ever do a podcast where, you know, particularly with as many as we do, where we could have somebody on every day. But it is nice to talk to another person about these programs and about related topics. And I hope we find other hosts, and certainly we, we've got plans for uh, a few other guest appearances, particularly on our Amazing World of Radio Summer Series. All right, well, now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. And I want to thank Jim and Rachel, Patreon supporters since March of 2016, currently supporting the podcast at the Shamus level of $4 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support. It's truly appreciated. And we will be back next Wednesday with another episode of Dangerous Assignment. But join us back here tomorrow for Mr. Chameleon, where... Before we start talking, though, let me tell you, if you think I killed that skunk Sayers, well, you better have another guess. You did kill him. You did. You know you did. Shut up, Phoebe. Who are you, miss? She's no Miss Chameleon. She's my niece, Phoebe. Mrs. Harold Sayers, that dead pup's wife. She's a fool. I'm not looking for opinions, Mr. Winters. I'm looking for a murderer. Now, Phoebe, you say your uncle here killed your husband. I know it's unspeakable. Horrible of me to say it, Mr. Chameleon, but I know Uncle Silas killed my husband. He told me himself this afternoon he would. You forgetting what you owe me, Phoebe? No, I, I'm not forgetting. I owe you everything I've got in the world. Everything. But that doesn't mean I'll stand by and not tell the police you killed Harold. Mr. Chameleon, my uncle Silas Winters deliberately murdered my husband. That's what I told the policeman who came here first. Now I... I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.